As we start tonight, I'm going to introduce our guests so you know who is here uh, to visit with two school boards. Again, thank you all for being here this evening on uh, a special occasion for both school districts. Uh, first, we have Deputy Director of the Department of Ed, Dr. Jim Berger, speaking. We have uh, Dr. Amy Williams, who's the Bureau Chief of School Improvement. In addition, with them, we have Dr. Lane Kluge, the Chief Administrator of AEA, Green Hills AEA. Thank you for being here. We have Tom Cooley, who's the Director of the Bureau of School Finance. Uh, Sue McCurdy, right here, she's an uh, administrative consultant. We have uh, Janet Boyd, who's the AA Department of Ed representative for our area and has worked with us on our site visits. And then Thomas Mays, uh, attorney for the Department of Ed, who are here with us this evening. So let's welcome them. Uh, 
even in the best of situations, you're having sometimes cut and make ends meet. Um, it's a tough situation. And so uh, the state has to help you in all cases. If you're familiar uh, with this concept that we had for many years, of like the guarantee that was in place that kind of promised districts that were losing enrollment that we meet you at a certain level and kind of brought the for the kids. Uh, legislature opted to phase that out over a period of 10 years. And so now the, the realistic problem you have when you're losing kids or even staying even is that costs are going up and you aren't gaining any enrollment, you're, you're cutting, right? And the state isn't pitching in to help you out of that. So the re reality is, in a situation where you're losing money, uh, you either have to generate more revenue, which usually means kids, or you have to cut the cost to try to keep things balanced. In the state of Iowa, uh, we don't allow districts to operate in the red. That's a good taxpayer protection. It also forces conversations about viability of school districts. Uh, if you can't operate a basic program in the black, it is probably the right thing to do to talk about the other options. Right? So uh, that's kind of how we got here. One of the one of the ways we get into this conversation with you is on the fiscal end. Uh, I think. You as board members are probably more familiar than people in the audience. But there's a school budget review committee that is a, a governor appointed state committee that can grant additional property tax for certain situations, right? They are also a group that's charged under law to monitor all districts' finances. So, um, a couple of people that I brought with me, one of my work units under me at the department of is a school finance unit. So every year school districts submit certified annual reports on finances that show your balances. And one of the things the school budget review committee does every year is to monitor those balances and if we see trend lines that are projecting you to go into the red, we're sending a notice to the board president, uh, superintendent, and business officials saying, uh oh, your projection is bad. They don't, now, that's the first year. They don't usually like getting those messages, but it's a nice thing to get early because then you can have a talk about what you're going to adjust to change your, change your mind, right? When you get to two years out and you've been in the red twice, that is the group that says, can't continue, you've got to give us a plan for how you can fix this. This is the group that typically will say, you've got, to, if we're going to give you any extra authority to generate more revenue, you've got to cut in an equal amount to balance that out. That puts several, several districts every year in a tough spot. And last year, Farragut probably was the one in uh, the position where they had more, uh, more problems dealing with this issue. You were on balance negative 550,000 last year for the second year in a row. That prompted the SBRC to say, somewhere in the neighborhood, I'm using round numbers. Uh, that prompted the SBRC to say, you better go in and see what's going on. So at that point, we knew Farragut was whole great sharing some with Hamburg. We decided to do fiscal reviews to both because of the whole rate sharing and doing some money back and forth, and it was worthwhile looking at the whole rate and see how it sat. Uh, last year, Hamburg was in a position of negative forty-five or fifty thousand dollars, so that's not a significant deficit, but it was the second year in a row. Uh, at the same time, there were some concerns on the programmatic side. We like to talk about that. In a Detail, but both of these thoughts kind of came together when we decided to do a review. Because honestly, in real life, for all of you, the two things aren't separate. The money supports the program, and the program is delivered by the money. If you're cutting and you're cutting too far, you may cut into what you're able to offer kids to the point where the state would say, you can't cut anymore. Still in a negative position, 
then what do you do? If we're saying you've reached the basic level, you can't go further. So uh, again, this is kind of a numbers game on the kids' end. What we know about your projections, and this is the hard part of the conversation, is that they're going the wrong direction. We, we, we are projecting that Farragut this year is going to be in the neighborhood of 800,000. I think the updated number may even be worse than that. We're projecting that it will be somewhere between 250 and 300,000 in the whole. And it's unfair to really point fingers at why that situation is occurring other than the cost of running the program is exceeding your daily revenue. There's lots of variables that flow into that and reasons why that's true. But unless you change the trend line, you can't get back. You can't get back to the line. So our, our review on this phase two visit was an attempt to look at your situation accurately looking at both the, the fiscal side and the program side to see if there were any possible scenarios that might be viable here to try to pull this out of the fire. I, I regret to tell you that one of the functions of the State Board of Education is to ensure that the basic, basic programs met. And I don't know if you remember four or five years ago, we had a district in Southern Iowa, Russell, that was in a similar negative situation. They couldn't find a partner. They were kind of in terms of what they could do. And that financial picture was actually not as bad as Barrett's. We had no choice at a certain point to say, as a state board, you can't continue to exist. And that, that district was resolved. Uh, that is the last resort of this conversation. What we want, what the message really is tonight, is you have a limited window to be able to control how your situation is involved because the state isn't waiting much longer to try to find a solution to the negative trend line on the fiscal side. Now, that's kind of the setup for the conversation we're open to where this goes, but we want to, we want to urge you to understand the, the weight of the conversation. Right? Um, what I want to do is turn it over to my partner, Amy, to talk a little bit about uh, the review and how we how we're viewing the program site. Um, I also want to just take a moment to thank you all for allowing us to come and speak with you tonight. I met um, a number of the board members and a number of the members of your community, teaching staff, uh, administrators, and the buildings. We were here for our visit in June. Even though school was closed when they came in to speak with us, we really appreciate it. And you know, that nothing but helpful in uh, getting us to understand uh, the situation and what you uh, do and don't have uh, to supply us with information wise and um, getting to understand the program requirements uh, and what, what you all are trying to do at this time. And so we just really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program requirements um, under IO code and some of the federal requirements um, and what you can expect to be receiving from us in terms of written reports and how the process will play out from there, um, how that interacts with the fiscal components, and we will talk about the interaction and how that's important. Uh, I know you're all waiting for the written reports. Uh, you can expect to receive them early next week. Um, they are very lengthy and very detailed. Um, and we are more than happy to have a call or a, a, a face, face web, web meeting with you. We can come back now and see um, and go through that in detail. Um, we wanted to give you a basic preview that they will contain um, all of the non-compliant citations that have to do um, with program requirements, a summary of the fiscal audit, um, and a summary of accessibility issues um, that have been long-standing. Um, all of which need to be fixed, and the process going forward looks like this. Um, both districts received a uh, previous uh, standard accreditation visit in 2010 and 2011. Both districts have outstanding non-compliance citations from those years that have yet to be remedied. 
that's part of the reason that we came for a phase two visit. Um, is, and some of those are easy things to fix, like having uh, board policies revised. Some of those things are more difficult to fix, like being offered to teach requirements for your high school program. Um, and by that, I mean um, perhaps you don't have enough units for your technical education. Um, and I'm not saying that necessarily is the case for both of you, I'm saying that there are things that are easier for people than others, and I'm sure they're much more. Um, and again, those will all be detailed in the day for you, and you'll be given a time in which those can be met. So we have outstanding citations from the previous visit, and then we have new citations that were discovered when we were there in June. In addition to those program citations, um, and we also have a table of citations that have to do with the voluntary compliance plans that both districts entered into back in 2010 and 2011 with the Federal Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education. And many of you may not be familiar with this, so let me just give you a brief overview. Um, in 2010 2011, it was, it was determined that a number of the buildings um, that are uh, used for classes are not accessible to people with disabilities, and that the programs that are offered there are not accessible. And the district was required to enter into what the Office of Civil Rights calls a voluntary compliance plan. And the word voluntary is a little bit misleading there because it's not exactly voluntary. Um, what's voluntary about it is the way you decide to go about enacting it. Um, but you must actually uh, go through with the actions of the compliance plan. Um, a number of the things in the compliance plans were never actually fulfilled. Um, and so, uh, some of these things involve having a written plan to ensure program accessibility, and so those would be easier things to take care of. Some of them involve um, very expensive uh, fixes, like uh, installing an elevator um, or installing a uh, shower um, that is accessible to people with disabilities. And so some of these are very high cost items, um, and that is where it starts to interact with it budget requirements that you're facing. We have uh, got the original timelines for following through with the voluntary compliance plan have expired. We have spoken to the Office of Civil Rights and they have let us know that they are not interested in referring this uh, for further action at this point because they would like to let us have our state process work out. Um, but you will see uh, on the chart that you will receive that all of those non-compliance items also need to be fixed on the plan and provided in the chart. And so when you receive this and you want to provide a response to the state, um, those are all items that need to be fixed that you can agree as well. Um, and we can talk again in detail about how we might go about doing that. So the way this will play out is you'll receive reports from us. Um, each district will have 30 days to craft a response back to the state. Um, and you will need to give us a plan and correction for all of the items that are in there. So, everything for program non compliance, a plan for um, correcting the financial situation that Jeff talked about, uh, and a plan um, for correcting all the accessibility items so that we can satisfy the most number requirements. Uh, after that, uh, the original report and the district's response will be taken to the State Board of Education. Um, and they may vote to uh, put each district on the corrective action plan and allow them to work that corrective action. Um, once uh, that corrective action plan is completed, so there will be an end date on it, and it needs to be within this whole year. Um, we're going to come visit again and see if everything is taken care of. Um, and if so, um, the board would like to have no further action, but then the board will meet again. If everything is not corrected, then they need to come up and take further action. And have a couple of um, options available to them. They can place, um, they can place different requirements uh, on the accreditation of the districts. Um, and they can also choose to dissolve uh, one of those districts. We'd be facing a vote on dissolution at that point. Um, 
um, we wanted to understand that you can choose to enact these corrective actions independently of separate districts. Um, you can move forward with your plans to consolidate. You can move forward as districts for appropriate sharing. That part is all up to you, but just as the corrective action is all up to you. So, for context, uh, on this as well, uh, I understand the petition has been filed to be a considered possible merging of districts. That's, that's a positive step. Um, in Iowa, we would not allow two districts to merge if the combined enrollment was less than 300. So, part, part of the dilemma of this small schools losing enrollment, especially if you have some help migration in terms of enrollment because some other attendance centers are bigger, um, how many kids are you actually serving, how many residents here, about 420 combined residents. I don't know where your numbers are at this fall, maybe less than this last, last fall. Um, so consolidation is certainly a legal thing at this point. So you're not going to get any barrier to doing that from the state's end you're going to be over the 300 count. The problem with some smaller districts merging, though, is if you're both in the negative position this week, merging that basically merges the obligation of the as well. So nothing really disappears in this process. The obligations kind of carry forward and make what you hope in a reorganization is that efficiencies can be gained where you can reduce costs. One way that typically happens with districts is to help close attendance centers. You want to talk about the worst conversation to have for any school district deciding to go into a town that has an attendance center and tell them, Nine. That's just as hard as going to work. So the options are uh, uh, pretty limited. You do legally have this arrangement to over a share, you have a petition on, on the table to consolidate. There are other options being considered in other parts of the state. Uh, some some multi-district consolidation would be considered where you're going more of a county-wide. That's, that adds very to the equation if you were to start talking to districts like Shenandoah or East, is it East Mills, right up the road, Sydney. Uh, now you've got three different variables, right? So it, it may be more than you can handle at this point to get all that involved. But uh, we're standing here saying we're going to help you sort that out in whatever way it can be a positive outcome. I know that's after all of this talk about where you stand, that, that seems a little bit odd here. We really would prefer not for the state to sort this out. This is an issue that is personal to you. You live here. It's, it's kind of an issue that we want in your hands to make a decision on what's the right option. Uh, so the report is going to lay all that out. Uh, I will tell you our options on our end are limited. With the school budget review committee and the fact that both districts are in at least a two year position. What typically happens is that the school budget review committee uh, will recommend a phase two fiscal. We've already had a phase two fiscal. So that takes one of the options that that committee has off the table. The resolution of the phase two will be a big thing. Amy talked about that, the compliance plan is really the last gasp before the state board takes an action some way up or down. Once it gets to the state board, they really don't have a lot of options other than to say you met the conditions of the plan or you didn't. And if you didn't, in Iowa, as soon as a school district is not accredited, it doesn't exist. Right? So uh, that's kind of the lay of the land from our end. Happy to hear comments or questions, or if there's something you want to chew on more, we can, we can certainly do
And my question is, when we get this letter, this document, and we'll have 30 days to respond. Okay. In the document itself, we've got established deadlines. In each table, there will be a non-compliant citation and a deadline. Um, what we would like to see come back is how we plan to meet that deadline, what we would be willing to accept in certain circumstances, if you had a good case to argue, is why we would meet that deadline, and how we would meet a deadline that's awfully close to it. So, hey, we could meet the deadline on, say, November 1st, but we could do January 1st, and here's how. Um, but in all cases, it does need to be during the school year um, because the state board still needs to act during the school year. And I even think the state board, in some cases, would be willing to um, say uh, if something couldn't be done until after they need to take action, if they need some progress on it, they might even um, be able to see some action on that and be okay with it. But we can't have this plan to take action after this. Um, the question was when would the state board meet again and take action on this? Our hope is that after your 30 day response comes back to us and the state board meets on it first, the first time, and we hope that that would be an October or November meeting. Um, we're currently in some discussion with the department on whether this would be a state board October or state board. Or November action, we would be giving you at least four months for corrective action time. And so we'd be looking at a spring board meeting, possibly March. Um, and here we're going to say April. Maybe just one more time to acknowledge how hard a conversation this is. The consolidation vote is, is uh, you know, I remember the one that happened in my hometown. We had all sorts of small communities around us that also ceased to exist shortly after that vote in the early 90s. We spent years, I was, you know, I was a 1978 grad, and we spent years beating each other's brains in. There wasn't any possibility that a man was going to emerge with. Iowa Valley and Marengo, or Norway, and that community. We went with the only partner that was, uh, that, that was neutral. And I don't know if that's the right way to consolidate, but uh, I'm acknowledging that when you have long standing relationships and long standing community members, uh, having this conversation about change is a fearful thing. And uh, it's, all, it's the hardest conversation you're going to have as board members, as community members, so I'm not wanting to diminish that. We just want to uh, reinforce that you have to exert control of your situation now and be able to steer it. With these uh, imminent deadlines and, and a vote in December on, on consolidation, how do we how do we approach an answer when we don't know exactly what we will be looking at like as we go into the coming year? So you want to put a plan in place that covers both 
I, I will tell you a case study up in Xyra and Elkhorn. Two, two contracts in communities that ended up consolidating, we were in exactly the same conversation up there. Both communities actually were fading away with uh, enrollment. The levy amounts in both communities were significantly different. So getting populations in both communities to agree to want to do this, one community didn't want to, right? Their mill levy was four cents lower than the other. Why on earth would they assume an average uh, the, the debt when they knew their taxes were going to go up? Right? They didn't have to merge. Exira was in a multi negative year situation. And they did proceed with phase two in the same way that your districts did. Uh, we were positioned with the state board, and I, fortunately, they made the right choice for themselves. It was a bit of a strong arm up there. Because one of the communities didn't want to take the vote. But we had to help them understand that if they didn't do that, the state board was positioned to dissolve them. Exactly would not have existed if they hadn't taken the vote to merge with Elkhorn. Uh, not, it wasn't a threat, it was a reality based on their negative position. It wasn't fair to taxpayers, it wasn't fair to kids. So I'm not equating your situation to that. I'm trying to show you that there's a sequence to this that has an end at some point and again and we want you to assume control over it rather than us. Would you reduce some of the financial incentives the state has in place to help bring it back and solve this work? If you're, if you're moving down the path of consolidation, there is an incentive, supplement, additional supplementary weighting in terms of kids. Um, my people over here can probably speak better to that, but I can summarize it well enough. If you're moving down the path toward consolidation, you can get three years worth of additional weighting to generate some revenue to facilitate the transition, and that would work both districts. There also is a, a beefed up operational sharing doesn't have anything to do with consolidation, but it is an incentive to share positions. Uh, for example, if uh, Hamburg and Farragut wanted to share a superintendent, each district would generate an additional eight kids on their certified county. Okay? So that's another way of bringing revenue there. Seven different positions in law that will generate some additional money just by sharing transportation, maintenance, you, you know, have the human resources director and assuming that's max. So you're already getting your 20 Good, so you know about that. But that's not extra So those are the two primary ones. Yep. So do you know the uh, number of kids that you get in that? The reworking center?
for each district, and also the Bureau Heights district. And the plan has enough in it uh, to match what would be the combined budget authority that would be available for the district in the upcoming uh, fiscal year. So it would be within what it is that we need to spend, or it would be able to spend, we need to spend, but we have it available to spend based on the normal program. Is that the kind of plan that the ASPRC would be able to be on to help the district? When we know that we're coming to you with a combined negative of the authority in the neighborhood of 1.2 million or something like that. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. They're tracking you separately on your balances and you're still set with governance, which is a sticky part, but honestly, what the SPRC wants to see is a, a pulse and a you know, positive move. So I can't speak for them. They're, they're kind of quasi-judicial and they make their own decisions on where they stand. I think if we felt good about the direction this was headed and we saw some positive light at the end of the tunnel, we would sure be in there pitching for uh, a positive resolution. So um, can't quite predict. I know this SBRC wants to see reductions in the equivalent amount of modified a lot of growth rate, uh, and if we were looking at combining districts, and it seemed to be a plan that worked out, particularly given the vote, I think that would be a more favorable, favorable position. In the past, yes, we are seeing when schools have consolidated, it's my understanding that they have looked very, very poorly and brought those numbers to at least zero. Is that correct? In the past consolidations? Trying to cut over a million dollars from my budget. Creating some 
glad we showed that in the time that we have before the other person needs it. It's probably uh, all you can do to just create a plan for what it looks like after you bring it together. And uh, so you may be running two scenarios, right? You may be running a scenario if you consolidate how you manage the joint combination of resources and, and debt to kind of get on top of this. If the consolidation vote fails, what each district has to do to, to make it right. Uh, that's, that's a harder scenario to run. I think it's a fair thing to say that it's, uh, you're right, is it possible with a combined five million dollar operating budget between two districts to take a million dollars out of that in the current year. <coughs> you can't do that. Um, so it's more about the plan for how you're going to do it. Is it appropriate when we just present this situation? When we receive this report, this detailed report, our thoughts would be to post this on our website to make it available for our patrons to see. That's too safe. Okay, but everything from our end is going to be public. Okay, so I think we can promise everybody that once we get it, we'll share it with the report. We got 30 days to respond. Well, I think if we have a couple of courts, I appreciate very much all of them being here this evening. Partners coming to the city. They're happy to go back to you guys. We're all looking at it. Okay. Thank you.